Uh, can I preach a sermon to you? Yes. Great. I was going to anyway, but I want to preach to you uh, a sermon called the two twelves. The two twelves. We've got a bit of a passage of scripture. We're going to be all right. It's a bit of a read. It's going to be on the screen. It's in Mark, <clears throat> and uh, Mark five verse twenty one. And it says this, When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about Him and He was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And seeing Him, He fell at His feet and implored Him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be made well and live. I love this. Jairus is a pastor. He's Pentecostal. He wants Jesus to lay hands on his daughter. And he went with Him. So once again, let's try and read Scripture, not as just a text, but as something that happened with real humans, with real emotions in it. He is saying, Jesus, please come quickly. Now, I have a daughter now. So this Scripture hits a little bit harder. Before I was like, oh, Pastor Jairus, so sweet. Now I think about if it was Micah, I'm like, Jesus, we got to go. we got to go. So he starts following him and the great crowd followed him and thronged around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. Someone say 12. Who had suffered under many physicians and had spent all that she had and grew no, uh, was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even the hem of his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out of him, this is crazy, immediately turned around and said, who touched my garments? Pause that quickly. I love what Benny Hinn says. If Jesus felt something leave him, what did she feel hit her? If it was enough with hundreds of people thronging around, but someone touched him in faith, man, anyway, it's just for free. And the disciples said, you, the disciples are great. The disciples are me always. They just say whatever's in their head. You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened before him, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. She told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, be healed of your disease. Now, I love this because let's jump back quickly to Pastor Jairus. He is standing on the side, probably going, are you serious? Like, I've heard the the, the story of Jairus' daughter preached a bit and the story of the woman with the issue of blood preached a lot. But to preach these texts separate from each other, I think is to do a disservice to the context of the moment. I don't know what Jairus was doing, but I would have been annoyed. And then this happens. While he was speaking, there came from the teacher's house, a ruler's house, someone who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Can I tell you really quickly, Jesus was very aware that this child was dead. Jesus just loves to prophesy from point one. Jesus just loves to go to situations and go, no, this. Why are you weeping? She's not dead. Because immediately Jesus, when he comes into situations and circumstances, he flips the perspective. He says, no, no, you're seeing it wrongly. Look from my vision, look from what I see. And they laughed at him. This is, once again, not a movie, happened. Jesus, a pastor comes and says, please can you heal my daughter, she's about to die. Jesus is like, let's go, Pastor Jairus. They're walking through the city, people start thronging. Someone stops him, Jesus stops and goes, who touches me? Jairus is like, we gotta go, come on, hurry up. Then he heals this woman, this woman tells him the whole truth and when women tell the whole truth, it can take a little bit of time sometimes. <laughs> Jairus is on the side going, something bad's gonna happen. Someone comes from the house and his worst fears are realised. This woman goes happy, but Jairus goes sad. They go to the house, there's people wailing. Jesus prophesies life over something that's dead and then they laugh at Jesus. I love this next verse. And I don't know, maybe some of you have, but I don't know if you've caught this before. Listen to this. So they laugh at him, but he put them outside. (laughs) 
He put them outside. Oh, let's do a look into that. You know, we're there at church. Like, he's a good, good father. He is, but sometimes he is so, so gangster. Like, it's like, you don't want to laugh at Jesus, man. Like, you don't want to get in the way of faith when faith is wanting to perform a miracle. So he put them outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went to where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Gamaya, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking for she was 12, someone say 12, years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this. And I love this, this is the best way to end a miracle. And then he said, get her something to eat. Have you ever been? in a revival service or at a revival conference and you get absolutely wobbegonged in the spirit and you're like, oh, this is amazing and demons are coming out and Ben Fitzgerald's putting his hand on you. But then like as the service ends and it finishes and you're free and healed, delivered and the first thing you think is, I need some food now. It's a real thing. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the couple of minutes we have left. I thank you that you'd speak by this word. Let this not just be some funny stories or or, or a sermon with a couple of points, but Lord, would you reveal things to us about your nature and who you are in your scripture. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I didn't say who I am, but I thought the intro was great. But my name's Fred. Hello. Uh, I am married. I've been married to a lady called Anna. For a lady? A lady called Anna. For a girl, a lady, a woman uh, called Anna for almost 10 years. She's amazing. I think we've got a photo of her somewhere. She's the love of my life. She is way too attractive for me. Um, what I don't like, if I'm being honest, is I show photos of me and Anna across the world and people gasp. Like they can't believe that she married me. And it's, it's honestly a bit hurtful. Um, but uh, 10 weeks ago, uh, we had a little baby called Micah. I think we've got a photo there of us and Micah. Uh, and so we love her. Uh, she's the best. She keeps us up at night, which is fine because then you get to listen to Pastor Glenn, uh, which is uh, really powerful and amazing. But we're very in love. And as uh, Pastor Simone said, we're taking on the leadership of our church in a couple of weeks from my amazing parents. So God is good. The two... Twelves, the two twelves. What we see here is we see two stories uh, that are really inexplicably linked, but you've got to look deeper in the text to figure out why they're linked and then deeper again to figure out why should we care. I don't know about you, but growing up in church, sometimes like the preacher would preach and it wasn't that they were preaching badly, but I was like, why do I care though? So my job in the next few minutes is to show you how these stories are linked, convince you why you should care, and then lay hands on all of you. So that's gonna be good. Um, I was messaging uh, a youth leader. Who here at some point in their life had a youth leader? Someone that checked in on them, looked after them, drove them, yeah, good, good, good amount of us. Some of us didn't. Sorry for you, not that you didn't get that. But youth leaders are amazing. I had a youth leader called Jeremy Cake. He was a great youth leader. He actually didn't just walk me through my youth years. He walked me through falling away from God and coming back to the Lord. He actually brought me back to God. And he was amazing. And he did all the things, Macca's trips, texts, phone calls. And I was, I was thinking about him the other day. I was holding Micah. All of my stories for the next 17 years are just going to be about Micah. So Australia needs to just live with it. And I was holding Micah and I had this crazy thought. I thought, Micah wouldn't be here without Jeremy. And the reason is not what you think. It's not just that he brought me back to God. It's that he had a 21st birthday party. I was in year 10 and I was sort of coming back to God, kind of, you know, pastor's kids, we've got issues. And um, coming back to God and he had this, this Pirates of the Caribbean 21st birthday party. How good are Christian circles, you know what I mean? We don't drink or get drunk. We dress up as Johnny Depp, you know what I'm saying? And so he had this party and I went to this party. I was just, gradu- I was just going into year 11 and I, and I went as Johnny Johnny Depp and I'm like strolling around like why is all the rum gone you know having a great time and 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 I went up to this group and there was this beautiful girl in this group and we had a conversation and we both said the same thing we said hey do we know each other like do we, did you what school did you go to I quickly found out she wasn't in school anymore and I was like damn it uh, but but we chatted and then about four weeks later I went back to church and recommitted to the Lord and the week after I'm on in the worship and I look to the left and there's this girl. Afterwards I got to her and go, hey, what's up? I met you at Jeremy's 21st. Long story short, we became friends. Then when I graduated school, we started dating 
And uh, then we got married. We do what married people do. Mark is the evidence of that. And so I messaged Jeremy Cake and I said, Jeremy, I would not have a daughter if it wasn't for you. You were involved in my daughter being here. He replied and said, what are you talking about? I said, no, no, no. I said, at the 21st, I met Anna. And without your 21st, I would probably wouldn't have met Anna, wouldn't have come back to church. And Mike is the product of that. And, and we said, glory to God, amazing. And Jeremy thought I was a bit weird. But I was just having a moment where I was like, man, the, 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 the weaving of the tapestry of God, the way He weaves little testimonies, little moments, little moments of obedience that lead to miracles. And really here, we, we have a similar thing. We, we have two stories that are connected. We've got Jairus and we've got woman, the woman with the issue of blood. I think we've got a, a, a comparison between the two twelves here. Uh, if we could put that up on the screen, that'd be awesome. So the first difference between Jairus and the woman, can we teach for five minutes? Is that all right, 4 p.m.? Uh, is Jairus is a man. Now, I want you to hear loud and clear, I do not think it is better being a man. It was back then. It definitely was back then. <laughs> you had an advantage automatically in Hebraic culture under Mosaic law if you were a man. She's a woman. We don't even know her name. Jairus is rich. Jairus is a religious leader. He has servants in his house. This woman is poor. Under Mosaic law, she was unclean. She wouldn't have been working. She wouldn't have had a husband. And Jairus is a pastor. Pastor Jairus, man. When he rolls through Jerusalem, people are like, Pastor Jairus, how are you? You know, he's walking around doing pastor handshakes all over the place. People love Pastor Jairus. This woman has been rejected from society. She would have had to go and collect water at a certain time so that she wasn't there with the other women. This disease did not just slightly inconvenience her. It ostracised her from humanity. Jairus had a family. He had kids, clearly. He had a wife. He, he, he had a family. And this woman has family dysfunction. We don't know uh, if she has distant relatives, but we know she, it says that she had nothing. She had no money. She was out of support, funding, and friendship. Jairus is viewed as clean. I didn't say he was clean. I said he was viewed as it. And this woman, under Mosaic law, is unclean. We don't have time to go into what that meant, but you have to understand this woman had a horrible, lonely existence. And, and what I love is desperation really levels the playing field in the Christian faith. You see, you might have rocked up in here, you're killing the game. You're a CFO, you got the latest Tesla, you're, you're making bank, or you might have rolled in here thinking about the next alcoholic drink you're gonna drink, thinking about those payments you gotta make. I, I don't know, but this is the thing. Desperation levels the playing field. Yeah. We don't come to Jesus as rich and poor. We come to Jesus as son and daughter. Yeah. And can I tell you, when you get that diagnosis, you don't care how much money you got. Yeah. And when you get that diagnosis, you don't care how much money you don't have. You just need help. Sometimes I think we forget in church, like this whole thing is predicated on need. Yeah. We've got to say, I need you. Yeah. I can't do this myself. Yeah. I need you. Yeah. Someone once said to me, Pastor Fred, I think Christianity is a crutch for weak people that can't do life by themselves. I said, my brother, you are bang on. <laughs> they went, what? I said, are you kidding me? I can't do life by myself. I'm an idiot. I need Jesus. I need Jesus in my marriage. I need Jesus when I go to Coles. I need Jesus. Jesus helps me. I need a crutch. His name is Jesus. He died on the cross. He makes me better. They were very annoyed because I thought I was going to get mad. They're like, well, I, think, I still think you're weak. I'm like, absolutely. In his weakness, he's strong. Like, I'm so weak. Like, stop trying to get mad at me because I don't have feelings. Like, Galatians 2.20, no longer you that lives, but Christ that lives in you. I'm in desperate need of a saviour. That's why I love the pursuit in this house. I love the, 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 the standard your staff take, the way they worship is because it vocalises to a city, we need Jesus. Yeah. We're not all prim and polished. Actually, we're messed up from the ground up and we need a saviour. Sometimes I wonder if desperation has left the church. People sometimes say to me, Fred, where's your favourite place to preach? To which I swiftly say, KCC. But after that, Actually, I've preached at services of over a thousand where it felt like everyone didn't need God. And I've preached at youth camps of 30 kids who knew they needed God. Give me the 30. 
Give me the hungry ones. Give me the desperate ones. I'd rather be at in Narendra Orange with 30 kids that need Jesus than in Ascot, Brisbane with a thousand people who are like, I got it made in the shade. We need Jesus. And these two people come to the foot of Jesus desperate for God. Desperate for Jesus. Let's keep delving into the details of this story. <clears throat> Me and Anna, a couple of years ago, we started watching a show called This Is Us. It's a show about, thank you for that cheer. Um, it's a great show. It's a show about family and, and it's really emotional. You cry in every, I just stopped in season three. I'm like, I, I can't keep crying all the time. But it's amazing. It's like a family and it goes through their life and jumps backwards and forwards. You see how the mum and dad meet. It's all very nice. The producers of This Is Us would love this story so much. Let me tell you why. The producer would go, Greg, let's have a, let's have a meeting. We've got to make a show called The Two Twelves. The producer would go, why? He'd go, well, bro, this is amazing. This will work so well with our model. Why? The director sets the scene. He goes, it's a sunny day in Jerusalem 12 years ago. And a couple with mama, with her belly, are about to go in to Jerusalem General Hospital. And they go in and it all happens. I just, wait, it's a childbirth. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> I'm fine. And they walk out, but you wouldn't see that in the show, right? Because in the show, the baby comes out fully clean with like done eyebrows. I'm like, how does the baby have an eyebrow curler? You know, and, and, but they would, the camera would pan and a Coldplay song would be playing and, and it would be amazing. They'd walk, they'd, they'd walk their baby out, the sun's on them, they'd take it to their camel and they'd put the baby on the camel and, and, and Jairus would be leading and they'd be praying and singing hymns of jubilation, you know, like Prince of Egypt, Hashia, Hashia. There can be miracles. You know, like it would be, it would be, it would be amazing. But then the director goes, cool, like a feel good story. He goes, no. Then the soundtrack changes. The sky gets dark and we pan across to a clinic where in the same year, a woman is leaving with a diagnosis that ruins her life. 12 years ago, a couple have a baby. Miracle, amazing, phenomenal. And a woman gets a diagnosis that ruins her chances at a future and at a family. But what I think is so beautiful is 12 years later, the two 12s are touching. The miracle and the diagnosis both meet the Messiah. And the director would be like, let's make it. And I would co-produce and make a bunch of money and buy a Tesla. <laughs> you don't need to have a degree in biblical numerology to know that some numbers in the Bible mean something. Seven is like one of our favourites. The number of completion. You know, the world was created in seven days, number of completion. Five's a good one. Five, the number of grace. Twelve is one of those numbers that if you read Scripture, it is everywhere. And I mean everywhere. The 12 sons of Jacob became the 12 tribes of Israel. When the Old Testament high priest met God on behalf of the people, he'd wear an ephod with 12 different stones. The New Testament high priest, who is Jesus, is seen teaching at the church at the tender age of? When he picked his crew, he chose? 12 is a number uh, in the Bible of governance and authority. The Pharisees would have a hem and they would have 12 t tassels, which represent governance and authority. We're going somewhere, stay with me. We're going somewhere. Jesus is the ultimate authority. He's the ultimate governance. He's the ultimate. Jesus showed authority over storms, food, death, demons, sickness, and attitudes. They're all epic. The last one is some like Jedi stuff. Do you remember that time when there was the guy on the mat and the religious leaders, it says they thought to themselves, who is he to do that? And Jesus is like, what'd you say? <laughs> Dude, I swear my wife has that anointing. <laughs> she's like, do that. And in my head, I'm like, why? Like I just, she's like, what did you say? I'm like, I thought it. <laughs> it's witchcraft. <laughs> Jesus is the ultimate authority. 
Brett, if you could come back and play the keys, that'd be amazing. Keep, keep staying with me. We're almost done teaching. Your awareness of His authority directly affects your faith. You see, faith is the anchor for our soul. But if I, I wouldn't, but if I went boating, which I wouldn't do, but if me and Dave Hicks were like, we're going boating, and we were on a boat and we were on the river, I don't even know what, a, what river there is here. Yarra, great. So we're on the Yarra, but then things start getting dicey and winds are stirring and I stand up with an anchor and I go, Dave, don't worry, bro. I got an anchor, but there's nothing attached to it and I throw it out. He'd go, what are you doing? I'd go, bro, it's the anchor. It's the anchor for our soul. We're good. No, no, faith, if it's not attached to anything, won't help your soul. The faith, your faith needs to be attached by a rope to the understanding that Jesus and God are the ultimate authority. So you attach, that's actually where your faith comes from and understanding that their jurisdiction knows no bounds. Some of us tonight, we have said some things that are outside the jurisdiction of Jesus. And we haven't actually vocalised that, but we've gone, that addiction, I've been doing it for so long. I've been praying for my kid for this long. I've been doing this, 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 this and this. And even though we would never say it, we've started to believe that it's outside of Jesus' jurisdiction. But I got good news for you tonight. It's not. It's not. All right, we've got to go back to the, let's go back to our story. And if we could maybe dim the house lights a bit, that'd be awesome. I want to give you three things I've grabbed from this text. And the first one is that an awareness of authority unlocks fast faith. An awareness of His authority unlocks fast faith. Jairus, Pastor Jairus has one level of faith. He rolls up to Jesus and goes, Jesus, you've got to come to my house. You've got to come to my house. You've got to lay hands. I need you there. You need to come to my location, come to my problem, my situation. Nothing wrong with that. That's a level of faith. Yeah. Then we see a woman with the issue of blood and she doesn't say to Jesus, you've got to come to my house. You're like, if I could just touch Him. Yeah. I don't need Him to come to me. I'll go to Him. But if you look in the Synoptic Gospels, you will find a centurion who goes to Jesus and says, I don't need you to touch me. I don't need to touch you. I just need you to say one word. Because you you are under authority, you have authority. And I know if you just say one thing. And what does Jesus say? I have not seen faith like this in all of Israel. Do you know what He just said? He just said, I have not seen faith like this in the disciples, my mum or John the Baptist. Because this centurion, somehow this pagan centurion understands that I am who I said I am. An awareness of His authority will unlock higher levels of faith in your life when you go, hey, God, you're over it all. One time I was uh, sent a bill by Optus for $745. My usual bill is like 50 bucks. I'm now at Telstra. But I said to... (laughs) I called them up and I said, hey, um, there's got to be a problem. I haven't gone overseas. I haven't been YouTubing like 24 hours a day. Like, what is going on? And this girl, bless her heart, she was young. She's like, um, it's saying it's your data. I'm like, no, no, totally. I'm saying it's not. And something's wrong. Like, could you look into it? She's like, yeah, I'm looking at your account and it's saying it's your data. You've, got, you've actually gone over your data and then it costs more money. I'm like, no, no, darling, I understand. So this went on for about 15 minutes. And eventually I said, hey, because at the time I'd been with them 11 years with Optus. I said, can you put a manager on? And she's like, yeah, I'll see if he's in. I'm like, you do that. Jesus loves you. Ah. About 10 minutes of hold music. I'm like, this is so frustrating. This guy picks up the phone. Mr. Porter? I said, hey, I'm ready. Have you ever been ready to fight? Hey. He's like, I just want to say, we apologize. We can see that you're a post 10 year client, uh, customer, and uh, we actually attributed the wrong bill to you. So we've waived that. And we're actually going to give you two months free uh, phone charges because we made that mistake. I'm so sorry about that. I'm so sorry that the customer service rep didn't know that you're a 10 plus year. You just have the best day. And I went, oh, yeah. <laughs> And it got me thinking that, 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 that 
She didn't have any authority. Even if she believed me, she couldn't have done what he did. But the manager, he's got the authority. Stop taking your problem, issue, need, petition to the customer service agent. Take it to the manager. Stop going to Facebook. Stop talking about it. Stop gossiping about it. Stop, stop. Take it to the one who has fire in his hands. Take it to the one that can actually bring you a breakthrough. We need to have an awareness of his authority. Number two, I'm almost done. An important interruption. I, I, I want us to, to quickly to get into the shoes of Pastor Jairus. His daughter is dying. Jesus stops in a crowd on the way to perform a miracle, starts playing 21 questions. Who touched me? If I was Jairus, I'd be like, what are you talking about? Who touched me? It's like a hundred people. Who to go? And then he doesn't just go, he doesn't just go, who touched me? It was you and you got healed? Praise God. I just got to go with the pastor. His daughter's dying. Bless you. Connecting to a church in your area. You're amazing. No, Jesus goes, who touched me? And then it says, she told him the whole truth. Anna's had some bad days at work and come home and told me the whole truth. It's not a short process. <laughs> Got to get comfy. Can you imagine being Pastor Jairus? Are you kidding me? Yes, it's very sad, your story. And that can sound rude, but he didn't know what she was going through. He just knows his daughter's about to die. An important interruption. You ever been there? Or you're believing for a breakthrough. You're like, my miracle's on its way. And then it's like coming to you and it feels like a conference. It goes and goes and hits someone else. You're like, oh, that was mine. You kidding me? And we like laugh about it. But then it happens again and again and again. And then we get the news that the thing, the hope, the promise has died. And our eyes turn dark. And we're like, are you serious? I went to you first. I started praying first. I had faith. I believed. Friend, I don't know what God's trying to say today, but it seems to be a bit of a theme. I was talking with Pastor Aaron about it, but God is not the great waiter in the sky where we click our fingers and we get what we want when we want it. You see, Jairus was desperate for a healing, but Jesus wanted a resurrection. Jairus was like, it needs to look like this. Do you think Jairus would have cared if Jesus went, by the way, your daughter is going to die. And then I promise, 100% guaranteed, she's going to be raised from the dead. The result is the same. The pathway is different. It's like we said this morning, if you only knew the boss's plan, if you only knew what he had. It's an important interruption. We often say at our church that someone else's blessing is not your curse. And often when you celebrate what God is doing for other people, pops open in you. Now you think it wasn't easy watching our, what do you reckon, Dave? Half our church have kids? I don't know what happened. I think COVID happened. Spirit of fertility just fell upon the house which I'm thankful for now. It's like doubled our church. But there's a small part of you, right? I pray, man. My gosh, we're having another baby. And you're happy. You're gen- they're your friends. You love them. But part of you is like, come on, man. And you have those moments where you're like, have I not served you faithfully? Have I... The problem with being a preacher is God will use your sermons against you. (laughs) Hey, Fred. (laughs) Because I preached this sermon before we had a baby. (laughs) Hey, Fred. It's an important interruption. Stop it. (laughs) It's for them, not for me. (laughs) Too honest, sorry. All right, last point. I respectfully decline. I, uh, I really like Nando's. 
Like, I'll show you how much I like Nando's. I'm not taking my shirt off. She can't show Brendan, hold this. That's how much I like Nando's. <laughs> yeah. I got that and I went home. I'm like, babe, babe, babe. Look, I got a Nando's tattoo. She was reading a book. She like looks up and goes, ah, it's a life decision, isn't it? <laughs> Anna really balances me out. It's great. But if I went to Nando's and and which I do often, um, shut up. And and I went there and I said, hey, just per chance, I said, hey, can I grab a half chicken and chips uh, with some extra uh, hot on the side uh, with some aioli creamy chip dip with a vanilla coke? And I ordered that and paid for it and sat down. I'd be ready, man. I'd be ready. I'm ready. I'm sitting down there. Oh, okay. My, uh, this thing happens when I walk into Nando's. I'm talking too much about Nando's. But I literally start salivating because of the peri peri. <laughs> Move on, Fred. If the waiter came up to me, they're doing avocado salad at Nando's, it's gross. If he came up to me and was like, hey man, I know you bought and paid for and ordered the half chicken and chips with the aioli and the vanilla Coke, but we just thought, man, why don't you try the avocado salad? Be blessed, bro, and he put it down and walked off. I would stand up on the table. And I'd be like, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, bring me my chicken. Because that's not what I ordered, and it's not what I paid for. There's some people in this story, so beautiful. They stand on the table of their time and of social norm, and they go, it's not what Jesus ordered. It's not what he paid for. Jairus stands on the table when the waiter tries to bring him. Hey, don't get that controversial teacher. Don't engage with him. What Jairus did was really risky to his career. And he says, I don't care. I've heard that there's fire in this guy's hands. I've heard that the dead are walking and that the blind are seeing and there's something happening. I'm going to engage with him. I, I decline caring about my career. I, my daughter's in trouble. I decline it. Yeah. And then we see this beautiful woman, man. I get emotional every time I talk about this. Who, like, you have to understand years and years and years of rejection. Yeah. And I'm not talking a loneliness like we feel in the modern age. I'm talking like an ostracization from society. Yeah. And so I just picture her, man, this is extra biblical, but I picture her at home going, I'm going to do it. I've heard rumours of this teacher. I'm sick of this thing. I'm sick of being alone. I'm sick of not having a husband. I'm sick of being in pain. I got no money. Every physician's cut me down there and nothing's helping. I'm going. And you better believe that the waiter from hell was going. Social anxiety, fear, disappointment. People are literally... You could throw rocks at mosaically unclean people. You could get hurt, everything. And I see this woman, man, going, I'm going to my Saviour. I don't care about what you're trying to bring me because I believe... There must have been something in her that was like, I'm going to get healed. He's going to heal me. She didn't have the context or the theology, but something on the inside of it. She walks, she moves, she goes through and she grabs the hem of his garment. Can you imagine the relief? As her actual order hit her. It wasn't even Jesus' time. But as that order hit her, can I tell you, the physical miracle was like 5% of it. Go have a family. Go enjoy society. I don't call you unclean. I reverse the diagnosis. And then, this is crazy, we'll finish with this. We see Jesus respectfully decline. He doesn't even take his whole crew with him. He's like, hey, sons of thunder, let's go. He rolls to this house. He's Jesus, He knew what was gonna happen. And something and some people rage against faith and they mock. And He goes, nah. The agenda of the Father is a resurrection, a healing and a breakthrough. Get your lack of faith out of here. And then I did a look, little look into it. Most theologians think that He physically removed them. 
I would pay actual money to see that. So son of man, like, you know, be blessed, my sister, you're healed, go. Get out of here. <laughs> They're laughing at him and he goes, no, 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 no. What are you doing? I decline your unbelief. There's a miracle in motion here. Mum, Dad, come into this room. Can you just for a moment imagine the moment where that little girl woke up? I love the Bible. There's not enough words sometimes. And they were in amazement. (laughs) I'll say. (laughs) She was dead. (laughs) I love this story of the two twelves. I love that there's so much we can glean from it as a local church. I love that it brings all walks of life together at the feet of Jesus. I love that it encourages us to lean into the faith that we have in Christ. I love that it teaches us to learn to wait on God. And I love that it exhorts us to kick the things out of our life that would hold us back. Why do we stand tonight? I know you know this, but the devil is a liar. And he will whisper and say anything he can to restrict you as a believer. Anything. I want to encourage you tonight to tell that voice to get out. You know the one. As you're going to bed, tells you to go on that website. You know the one. Tells you you're not doing good as a parent. You know the one that says you'll never find a spouse. You know the one. Says your best years are behind you. You know the one. Tells you no one at church likes you. It's demonic. And you can actually tell it, get out. Believers are having pillow talk with the devil, wondering why they never achieve the things in God. Kick that thing out of your house, man. Kick that thing out of your thinking. I had a moment, I shared it this morning, but I'll share it again. If you were here, act all surprised. But if we could put our, our friend Martin up on the screen, Brother Martin, if we if we have him, car salesman Martin. I was uh buying a new car the other day. And so I was really excited about it and I rolled into Mercedes-Benz in Brisbane. And um, I'm just kidding, I was at MG. (laughs) And uh, in the demo section, because you know, I'm a baller. And I walked in, I'd just come from the gym, which isn't important, but I want you to know that I work out sometimes. (laughs) And um, I walked in and I just said, hey, I'm looking to buy a, a demo car or second hand or whatever. Just, just had a baby, you know, need a bit more room. And Martin, this guy goes, I'd love to, I'd love to help you, mate, come into my office. He was one of the sales managers. So I went into his office and this is the thing about faith, right? You've got to believe Jesus is the ultimate authority because sometimes faith's weird. I close the door, I sit down and you know, I'm pretty personable, pretty likable, I think. You know, I like having a chat. I was like, oh, this guy seems great. And uh, he opens his uh, diary book car thing. And I'm like, oh, we're going to talk about different model options. He leans forward and goes, I died once. I said, what? He said, it was in New Zealand. I'd just gone skiing somewhere and I had a cardiac arrest and I died. I was like, oh, super strange. He goes, yeah. She starts talking to me like we're old mates. She goes, yeah, I think there might be an afterlife. And I don't want to sound weird. I think there might be a God. I said, a couple things. I agree with you. Why are you telling me? He goes, I don't know, mate. I just feel like something about you. I just feel like you'll get it. I thought, well, partially. <laughs> he then begins to tell me about when he was, when he was dead. He was dead for two minutes. He uh, went over this, he felt like he was in this black room and he felt peace in front of him and like dread and fear behind him. And then he like sort of came back. So I start talking to the Lord as Martin's talking to me. This is like three weeks ago. And I said, is this you, Lord? The Lord goes, what do you think? I said, I'm just checking. (laughs) He says, tell Martin that he's got a prophetic gift. I said, I don't know. It's super weird. Like, can I tell him like you love him or something? 
The Lord goes, fine, tell him he's got a prophetic mantle. I feel like the Lord was punishing me for my disobedience. <laughs> if I'd kept going, it would have been like, tell him, just speak in tongues over him. So I said, Martin. Martin goes, what is it, mate? I said, I think you might have a prophetic mantle. He goes, oh. <laughs> What's that? So I begin to tell him, I mean, I don't fully know. I called Glory. I was like, what's a prophetic mantle? Uh, but I begin to tell him, uh, it's when you hear from God and God begins to speak to you, reveal things to you about yourself or people in your world. Sometimes foresight, you'll see things before they happen. He slaps his desk, scared the pants off me. He goes, mate. I went, what? He goes, that's been happening to me my whole life. He tells me about 15, no exact, 15 stories of him having legitimate prophetic insights. You say, he wasn't saved. How does that work? I don't know. I don't know. Found out, he, God told him his grandma was sick. And so he said, grandma, you should go to the doctor. They found cancer. They were able to cure it. Like all this stuff throughout his whole life. I said, Lord, what do I do now? God says, pray for him. I said, Martin, I would love to pray for you. I didn't really want to, to be honest. <laughs> Martin goes, absolutely. Stands up, walks out onto the showroom floor. <laughs> I'm in the office like, Lord, this is cooked. Like, what are you doing? I'm out there, I'm like, Martin, come back. Martin, Martin literally goes, because he was kind of like the boss there. He goes, well, mate, if we're going to do it, we might as well do it in front of people. <laughs> uh, don't clap, don't clap. Acting all spiritual up in Numa, you all would have been like, get back in the office, except Cherie. <laughs> so I kind of edge out of the office. <laughs> you guys are like, why is this guy preaching here? I don't know. And so edge out of the office and it was just a holy time. I said, Martin, can I pray with you? He's never been in church. He's just had, I go, I want to pray for you. He goes, what do I do? I said, whatever comes naturally. He goes, all right. So I'm like, God, you're up to something. God goes, I know. So I pray for him and start praying for him. He starts shaking in MG. I'm just, the reason I'm so honest is one, because it's funny, but two, I want you to know that faith isn't always epic. I was looking around. I was very aware that everyone was looking at us and I hated it. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not Todd White. Like I was just like, this is the worst. I'm like sweating. I'm like, this is the worst. I just want Martin, just hide, you know. <laughs> Then the Lord says, ask Martin if he knows me. I said, Martin, do you know Jesus? He goes, I don't know. I'm like, fine, repeat after me. <laughs> and so Martin gives his heart to the Lord. Martin then goes, mate, that was brilliant. I feel good. Can I have your mobile number? I said, why? He's like, if I ever get any of those prophetic word things, I want to text you about it. I said, fine, Martin, here's my phone. Here's my car keys. Can I buy a car? <laughs> so we go in, buy a car. I got nothing off it too. After that, the one, I walked in and I was like, I'm gonna get a good discount. Martin's like, I can throw in mats. I'm like, what do you mean mats? Far out. I said this morning, I should have been like, Martin, I've got another prophecy. Just drop the price 10 grand. <laughs> no, come on, that's not good. We wouldn't do that. <laughs> you gotta tell that voice to get out. You guys got past the three years, you would have told you a hundred times in different words. You've got to not listen to it. You've got to just go. You've got to do it.